Hey y'all, I'm James Wright. Welcome to Camp Joy. Today we are building a timber frame ping pong table. It's strong enough that the whole camp can get on top of this thing. Let's pick up where we left off last time with some red oak. We're gonna start here with the long beams. These are the skirts that will go from end to end on the table. First thing we need to do is find the center point where we can put a cross member through. So we need another member to actually go through either of the two side skirts and we want it to extend out the sides and this is what the net will actually attach to. So I've got one of these that now that I have the table put together and we have all the legs on, I can figure out how long this center piece needs to be. And I'm going to basically create a long tenon on the end of this that is going to stick through the skirt on either side. And then in that, we will be able to mount the net. And so we're gonna be cutting down a shoulder and then a cheek, but a very, very long one. And this is incredibly fun, knocking out these big pieces with good straight grain that runs all the way through. Uh, yeah, this is, this is enjoyable. We're gonna cut in about halfway down and let it run along the crack. You can see how it kind of straightens out as you take a thinner cut. Once we get down close to it, then I'll we'll bring in the draw knife and really go at it with this. This actually takes off a decent amount of material very, very quickly and gets us very close to it. And then I can come in with the spoke shave and clean that out. But this one needs to be sharpened, so let's let's put that down and grab this one. Uh, it's always nice to have multiple spoke shaves so that you can go and find one that is actually sharp and, and do it out very nicely. That gets us really close to it, but thankfully this is large enough we can bring in the plane and smooth that out. For the net, uh, historically these were put on with like plastic spindly things, and uh, we want this to be durable. The the camp almost always broke these off, and so in this case I'm grabbing a 5 8 steel rod, and we're going to put this through that tenon, and this is what the net will hang on. So basically if a camper happens to break it, um, they will probably have broken themselves first. One end we're going to round over a little bit because it's going to go through the through the end of the rod and then the other end we're actually going to cut a slight slit in the top and so I'm going to start with a square file to cut a notch in here and then I'm going to bring in the hacksaw and cut down a little ways. This is going to let that tensioning string actually slide into it and allow you to tension the top of the net. I need to actually round it over a little bit because the string needs to round the end and come down in. So I can use a needle file to clean it out just a little bit so that nothing's going to be snagging on the, the string. And then we'll have a latch a little farther on. We'll show you what that is. But I want to clean these up so that no one's going to hurt themselves if they accidentally bump into them and nothing's going to be a problem there. I do want to drive them in very nice and tight, and so I'm going to start with a test rod uh, and see if it fits into the hole. Excuse me, test hole, not test rod. Tongue tied. <laughs> so once I get the hole the size I want it to be, then we can bore through. And this will basically be a tension fit. Right now, I'm, I just want to have the rod slide in there so that you can remove it if need be. Uh, but if in the future this is a problem, we can drill through the wood, through the rod, and out the other side and actually put a pin in there. Uh, but it's, it's really, really tight. It takes quite a bit of pounding to move it around. So we're going to leave it like that. Once we have one in place, then I can mark out the other end and make sure that they are the same amount and the same length sticking out. We can cut that down, and then I actually want to shape the end into kind of a half octagonal shape on here. Something that's a little bit softer, so if people run into it, it's not going to be as, as sharp of an issue. So I'm going to cut off the majority of the waste with a saw, and then I can come back with a plane and chisel and smooth that out. Here you can see where one of those notches in the middle and now we need to transfer it to the other side and I want to make sure that they match each other. I don't care what they are exactly in reality, I want them to match up. And once I get those marks laid out, then we can bring the square out and cut this hole. This is where this tenon fits into and that's one of the reasons why I made the tenon first so that I can lay it out and cut the mortise. That's why I always cut the tenon first because you can use the tenon to mark the mortise. You can't use the mortise to mark the tenon and uh, I just find that much easier myself. Then we can come in and remove the waste in between. I want to get out as much as I can with the auger ahead of time, and then we can come in with the chisel and, and bust it out. I was noticing that this one's getting a little dull, so a few seconds on here, coarse, medium, fine, strop, and we're back to the work. I always like having good chisels, and it's amazing every time that, oh wow, this chisel is actually working the way it's supposed to. I want to clean those out and create a small mortise for the small tendon, right? <laughs> You can see how this will slide together into that uh, long cross member, and this will be the, the center of the table, and it sticks out past the side 
for the net to then hook onto. I want it to be a little bit tight, but I want it to be able to slide in. Uh, so when I have it in place, the only thing's gonna hold this in place is friction. Once it's in, it, it's in. Then we can do the test fit and make sure everything works on this. I wanna make sure that everything actually comes together uh, before I take it up to camp and find out, oh, oh no. Um, at this point, I still had to cut all of the diagonal pieces. I had cut one for last video, but I hadn't cut them all for the final video. Um, and that was about two days worth of work cutting uh, all of those mortise and tenons, and there were quite a few of them. And then Luke, my videographer, can help me lift this up, flip it over, and get a feel for how big is it. And it's, it's really big. It's two and a half feet tall, nine foot long, and five foot wide. It's actually slightly smaller than all those dimensions because we'll have a top that goes on it. But this gives me a chance to just check my measurements and make sure everything came out exactly the way I want it to. Then we can take it apart and start doing all the little final finishing things. And one of those things is draw bores. So I'm going to take the mortise aside and I'm going to bore through with a half inch hole um, all the way through. And I can clean it out, make sure there's no splinters in there. And then I'm going to put the tenon back into that hole and slide it in. And then I can mark exactly where the tenon interacts with that hole. And I'm not going to drill through now. I'm going to take this out. And then I'm going to move it over towards the shoulder by about a sixteenth of an inch. And most of the time, if I just angle the bit here until it starts going and then straighten it up, that's all I need to, to move it over that sixteenth of an inch or so. Sixteenth to an eighth, depending upon how big it is. And then we can bore it through and you can see how they're not lining up. That's what I want them to be. So when I drive that pin through, it tightens them down. Speaking of the pin, we're just going to use some uh, half inch oak dowels. And I'll set up a stop on here so I can just cut them to town. And it cuts pretty quickly, except for I need 30 some of them because there are a lot of mortises and a lot of tenons in this. Uh, it's one of those things, oh yeah, this is a really simple design, just a, a few pieces of wood. Uh, but when you really want everything to be solid, it's a lot of work. We're gonna round over one end and I want it to kind of be a slight pencil shape. And this will allow me to drive it in and it rides past that, uh, that out of alignment hole. And on the other end, I chamfer the corners so that it ends up with a square end on there. On all of the pieces, we need to bring them back over and then we need to start chamfering and chamfer and chamfer and every piece is going to get chamfered at the joint and along the long edges, and there are chamfers all over this. And so this is one of those times when I absolutely love these chamfer sleds uh, because I wanna make the exact same chamfer everywhere. I can't quite make it here where there's a shoulder in place and that way I have to come back and freehand it, but at least I can chamfer the two edges and then play connect the dots and I can do those edges where the tendons are at relatively quickly. And the chamfer sled just makes it so much more uh, efficient and easy. I can kind of zone out and just go to town and it makes sure that the chamfer is at 45 degrees and is the same on all of them, except for it's going to be hours and hours of chamfering. All of these pieces on every edge, top and bottom, end to end, side to side, until you can see how they come together and the chamfers kind of match and meet up and you have that nice little clean fit. And I really like how that came out. At this point, as I finish chamfering a board, I actually take the tape off and I transfer the marks to the edges that aren't going to be seen. I put the marks on the tenons themselves or on the tops of the boards where things are going to be covered, and that way I have all the boards exactly marked. One of the other nice things about this sled is I can actually skew the plane in here so that I can do the corners of the, the, the bottoms of the feet. That way when the foot is on the floor sliding around, it's not going to be splintering it out. And I can still do that with the same chamfer sled. It makes it really nice and easy. And then we're basically ready for finish. And I actually want to smooth all this out. And so every surface is going to come in with a card scraper. And some of this I do before the chamfering and some I do after the chamfering. If a board is really kind of needs some work to it, I'm going to um, do that before I do the chamfering and others I'm going to do it after I do the chamfering. And I kind of go back and forth and some boards I chamfer and some boards I smooth. For the finish, I'm going to be using this rustic lumber. Uh, this is a hard wax, um, very similar to Rubio, but I, I've actually started using this more. Um, I find it to just be a little bit simpler and I like the, the finish on it just a little bit more. Um, not to mention it's actually more affordable, which I, th I think is the big reason I've been leaning towards it. But it goes on much like Rubio. You, you mix it in two parts and then you apply it on, let it sit for a few minutes and then come back and polish it off. And so I do about 10 to 15 minutes worth of wiping on and then I go back through the pieces and polish them off and then I move on to the next set and go out 10 to 15 minutes wiping on. And I think it was like uh, 35, 40 minutes to finish this whole piece. And that's it. It's done. Uh, if I wanted to come back in, um, I could use a ceramic coat to come on top of it and add that little bit more protection on there. Um, I may end up actually doing that on this one at a later date. Um, I don't actually have any in stock at the moment, and so I, I have some of that in order. Uh, so I may end up going back to camp in a few weeks and, and putting on the ceramic coating, but I want to see how it, how it goes without that. 
Um, so yeah, I've actually really been enjoying this, um, this finish and I, I love using a, a simple hard wax finish, set it on, polish it off one coat and done. Um, this one is nice because you can actually build it up with Rubio monocoat. You can't build it up. Um, but with this one, I, I can do that. So now we can take all these pieces to the camp and start gluing them all up. Um, and yes, I am doing these draw bore. I don't need any glue in this, but I really want to. And so I'm going to be using a bit of uh, a Total Boat high performance epoxy in here. Um, I really like using this as kind of a pants, pants, pants and suspenders. It works really well. And especially if there's any gap movement in there, epoxy is phenomenal for it. Way better than any uh, PVA. And I, I've been using epoxy more and more for just general wood glue ups. I, I found it to be, um, well, in most cases, simpler and, and a better glue. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me being weird. So we can start on this one by one and, and put these together. We're going to put together the two sides with all their legs, and then we can put in the center stretcher that goes between them, and then we can put on the ends into either of them. And you can see how this slowly comes together in each joint. We put in just a little bit of glue and Put that down, and drive in some pins, and then I can bring over the top from the old table. And you can see how this fits in here. This will get some screws to hold it in place, but it's really easy to, to switch out, pull out four screws on each tabletop, and put in the new one. And just like that, you've got a ping pong table. And I am I'm overjoyed with this thing. Really, really heavy duty. I just wish I got a shot of me playing on it. Yeah, no one wants to see that. <laughs> so, yeah, there you have it. So the problem is almost all ping pong tables are designed to fold up. And if they do that, they're breakable. And if you've ever seen a horde of teens at a camp, you know that they don't last very well. And the camp had to replace the ping pong table quite regularly. So building something like this that's solid enough that uh, any teen will be able to play on it without breaking it, uh, that's what we really wanted to make. So timber framed ping pong table. Um, I didn't make new tops for it because I want these to be easily replaceable. The idea is you can go on Facebook Marketplace and get an old ping pong table that the base is all broken out and most of the time the top is pretty good and so you can replace the top very easily. I had thought about making it all out of oak but then you'd have to come back and refinish it and redo it quite regularly and it's just easier to make a top that is replaceable. So I hope you like this crazy idea and if you have any questions, thoughts, or ideas you know what to do down below and really that does help us out. Anytime you comment, share, subscribe, like, all those things. Thank you. It really does mean a lot. Or if you hit the thank you button, the join button, or become one of these people over the side, those are some of the patrons on Patreon. And between patrons and members, you guys are the ones that keep this channel going. So thank you for that. If you'd like to find out more, you know what to do. I think that'll do it for now. And until next time, have a wonderful day. The problem with a timber frame ping pong table is now the ping pong balls are just, uh, well, they're too weak. So now we use pool balls.